All right. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. FOMC this week. I've seen some articles talking about how the Fed is kind of trapped. Um, they're not necessarily wrong. It just seems like they're maybe a little late to the party. It's about time they figured it out. We were talking last week about this same thing. The Fed is nearing that 5% target. And so, you know, at, at some point we're going to pivot. But as soon as they say we're going to pivot, the market is very likely going to explode to the upside. And that kind of goes against their mandate or what they have been focused on, demand destruction, wealth destruction. So they can't imply that they're going to pivot. They can't put out any sort of wink and nod and turn dovish at all. They got to come out hawkish. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're nearing that pivot. So if they're looking to give guidance, they have to do it in a way that doesn't bring the market up. And I, I don't know. I don't see how they're going to manage to do that. Looking at the volume this morning, we're sitting in the hundreds. Uh, Asia's back online after a week of holidays. Their participation shines through. We really don't have anything on the uh, agenda today. It is worth taking a look at what happened in the Asian markets. They opened up and sold off. With that, we had Brent with a nice sell-off and crude. Europe rallied up really nice. Now, the Asian markets are already closed, and they had started a little bit of a rally before they did close. But Europe opened really nice, sitting at the top of that zone. So we could see a little bit of bleed over into our market as this carries through into the day, especially since we really don't have a whole lot of econ on deck. So far, it hasn't bled over. We had that breakdown in the overnight and it was kind of a, a continuation from Friday's close and now we've stabilized. So we're in a little bit of a wait and see if Europe is going to lift the tides and uh, bring everybody up or you know, if Europe gives up the gains and the S&P and everything else continues to head to the downside. So tomorrow we have a lot more on the table, but everything this week is going to be focused on the FOMC. Normally, we would be looking for the FOMC report on Wednesday to be a, a volatility suppressor on Monday and Tuesday. But like I talked about last week, just because that's the norm doesn't mean that that's what we're going to get this time. And I don't believe that that's what we're going to get. Still looking for a grind higher. So I know we sold off a little bit in the overnight and we started that sell off on Friday, but As things stand right now, when we go in and look at the charts, we're still sitting in a pretty strong position. So, you know, don't just don't short this thing just because we happen to have sold off a little bit. All right, manufacturing survey at 1030 in, in the current conditions, sentiment matters. So we're going to be looking for a change in market structure at 1030. And then we have additional auctions at 1130. And we have some global 
uh, econ coming out later on tonight, which won't really be you know, our issue today. So the main thing is kind of just recognizing that we're very likely going to hold the range. And I'll lay out where that range is at. And that we have additional auctions on the front end really close. Three month and six month. Thirty eight hundred is the bottom of this range. I don't think we're going to see that. Certainly not today. And forty one hundred is the top of the range. This is the range that we have to deal with between now and FOMC. And, you know, um, that's a really big range. Right. If we were talking about trying to. Um, if we were looking at the Fed talking without actually saying anything me pointing out a range that goes from 38 to 41 and saying that's the range for the week well I mean, that's a really wide range kind of want to narrow that out a little bit all right so we got zones within this range it might make it a little better we got the lower zone between say 38 and 39 and then we've got the upper zone which would cover the rest. So you could break it down into two quadrants like that. That, that would at least clean it up a little bit. We've got a fairly significant trend line. I wouldn't get too hung up on where you draw it out at. Just recognize that we had higher lows and higher highs, and then we topped out against a previous area of resistance, and we so far haven't made it through there. I will caution, however, that there is a pre-breakout price pattern that Grimes wrote about in his book. He talked about, you know, a market will sometimes consolidate underneath a resistance level. It'll reach there and then it will pull back and uh, build up momentum underneath there. It's worth considering, especially since the liquidity resides on the other side of that pivot, and we haven't got into that liquidity yet. So, you know, if we were focused on a breakout that failed, it, it would look a lot like back here, right? When, when we did that on the 12th, we broke through that level, that previous area of resistance, and down we went. No hesitation, no fear. It's not what we got this time they look similar but um, they didn't this didn't get into that liquidity pool a, <clears throat> a break below say 40 31 cog line or 40 25 then we could make the argument that um, you know we're, we're very likely not going to continue basing at this high and then we're going to dump on back down again. But for the moment, sitting up in, in the level that we're at, as long as we're holding above this structure here, we can make the argument for a market that has the potential to still be bullish. No market maker move on deck today at, at the moment anyways. And that's not really too much of a surprise. Um, these sort of events, these FOMC events can be difficult because the market is going to look like it's going somewhere. You know, it'll make big sweeping moves and it'll run towards the highs or towards the lows with conviction. 
and make you think that it's going to break out and then just dump right back down again. We're really not expecting anything until FOMC, right? So we can gyrate around within this really large range, but no new leg up into new highs and no expectation of revisiting the lows. And you really got to think about it from a fund's perspective, right? They don't trade the futures the way that we do. Generally speaking, they're using the futures to hedge. So their goal isn't to get in at point A and get out at point B necessarily. Their goal is to protect something that they're already holding somewhere else, commodities, stock bonds they're they're holding something and they're going to hedge it with the futures well why would they go in and allocate a whole new position either you know getting into or getting out of something right before a major announcement when they need the information from the announcement to make a decision about what to get into or get out of so we really don't have any expectation of large position changes until after the FOMC, because they need that FOMC to make the decision about what to change. What we might see is that some of them are, who might be holding uh, additional exposure that they really don't need, they might dial that back a little bit. But if you read the COT report, the Commitment of Traders report, a lot of these firms will be, say, net long 100. I'm just using, you know, fake numbers off the top of my head. They might be long 100, while at the same time, they're short 95. So, you know, complete exposure might be five long. And they might look at that and say, yeah, let's just go ahead and scratch those five long, or let's add five more short, and now we'll be flat at net zero. And they'll still have 100 short and 100 long at the same time. A lot of times they won't get out of longs that they're in. They will just keep their longs. And if they want to reduce their position size, they'll just add shorts. It's the way of the world. So we could see a little bit of you know, reduction in position sizing. But that would be about all I would expect at the, at the moment. 10-day, 30-minute volume profile. The point of control is not exactly in the middle, but it's working its way down there. We still don't have a classic shape. If we break through the point of control and get through the 4011 cog line, we could drop all the way down to 3900 with fairly minimal resistance. There's a, a minor price shelf around 3990, but it hasn't shown to be very um, significant. And we punched through that level easily the last time we came down into that area. So I wouldn't expect it to even provide a first touch bounce. I think we'd just slice right through it. That's if we can get below the point of control and the strong volume at around 4011 cog line. Otherwise, when we're at the bottom of the box, we expect to go to the top. And when we're at the top of the box, we expect to go to the bottom. We do have that trend line that I was talking about. Again, I wouldn't get hung up too much on you know, where you snap it. It's more of a, uh, a visual than anything else. Price doesn't see that line. Right? It's your line. Nobody sees it but you. On Friday, we had got a new... VPOC. So we have 4088 to the upside and 3989 to the downside for VPOC levels. The um the sell off in the overnight sure presents itself better here on this 5 day 5 minute chart with the volume profile. You can see there was a significant level of volume around 4075.
that'd be an area to keep your eye on if we do manage a upside rally today. We're trying to build a head and shoulders down here. So far, uh, it's not working out, but we got the left shoulder and the head could see the right shoulder. If we were to get that, just some rough estimates of an inverse head and shoulder shot, you're looking at 4057 for half the move or 4063 for the entire move. That's all it would owe us. Now we could continue to go higher after that, but you know, if we're trying to play the inverse head and shoulder measured move ballpark estimate, be around 4060 for the entire thing. We can we can say that it's at least building in the right spot, right? Not like the other day when we had a head and shoulders at the top of the range, which is worthless. An inverse head and shoulders at the top of the range doesn't do us any good because it's not a continuation pattern. It's a reversal pattern. So at least it's down on the bottom. All right, 10 day, 30 minute volume profile um, kind of gave us some guidance right on that downside move. Line that up with the weekly expected move here. And we're again looking at that cog line, 4011, 4015. It'd be the bottom of the weekly expected move. And it would also coincide with, you know, that um, fallout level that we were looking at on the 10 day, 30 minute. So we're looking at a, the ES, it's still 1.7% above the 10 week. So above the 10 week, we're bullish. Uh, but you know, when when any market is above a level and we say above is bullish, bearish is below, once it starts heading back towards that line, you gotta kind of you know consider that it's over. So we are coming back towards the 10 but we're still above it and that's that's a good start and flip this over to a daily i think it provides a little more insight for our current situation so we're more than a half of a percent above the 10 day we are coming back towards it and as i've mentioned before when we leave the zero line and we make a move when it starts to come back, it almost always comes back to zero. Now, obviously, there are times where it has not come all the way back, right? Because nothing does something all the time. Just, you know, more often than not, when we start coming back to the 10, we actually make it all the way back to the 10. We've come up from below the zero, and we started towards the 10. That got shut down. Now we're headed back towards the 10 again. But we're still above it. And that's an important thing to consider. When we actually, if we actually get back down to the 10, we're very likely going to respond to that with at least a first touch bounce and then struggle to see if we're going to maintain above it or break below it. So we've rounded. We've started moving back towards the 10, but we're still above the 10. It is worth noting that we're below the three-day. If we were in a bullish trend, we would still be above that three-day moving average. Also, when we talk about how far away from the 10 we are, it often coincides with how far away the three-period moving average is from the 10. Now, this is something I've considered making an indicator to measure. 
just like I made one to measure how far away price is from the 10, how far away the three gets from the 10 would be the average of price, right? It's almost like making a moving average of one. It's just going to be right where price is at. So a three-day moving average, instead of us seeing these gyrations measure, you know, mess with our measurement of how far away from 10 we are, that average would kind of clean it up a little bit. Something to consider. I haven't done it yet. So this is how we ended last last week on Friday with the SPX. Since the ES has opened in the Globex, we're able to see you know where, what's its location in relation to the three period moving average. But with the SPX, we're still looking at that Friday snapshot of where we closed. When we bounced on that three period Friday. And then even though we pulled off of the highs, never quite making it you know a good good close on the week we want to see how we open in relation to this three period moving average and where we opened on friday so the spx opening below friday's open is going to be extremely bearish in our bias just remember we're not looking for you know a, a massive sell off here because we're waiting on FOMC. So round numbers, 4,000, 39. You could even throw some 50s in there. So 39.50 and 38.50 and then 3,800. You would be just absolutely shocked if you were to draw lines at round numbers and 50s on the ES and see how often price responded at those levels. It's what price does, right? It's why open, high, low, close, and round numbers are so important. From a technical analysis point of view, we really need to keep this low that was set around 39.40 if we're going to continue with the argument that we're just in uh, a bearish pullback. We've got these higher lows, and again, new higher lows at a higher high after this higher high and now this higher high. And remember, we need a full set to call a trend and a full set is two higher highs and two higher lows. Well, we have that. But if we break this, then that uptrend from the December sweep and the move to the upside is done. So we need to hold above that level. We have some really big names reporting earnings this week, and they are big enough to move markets. Microsoft was big enough to move markets. Microsoft came out with squishy earnings, and it still managed to pull off of the lows, maintain structure, and save itself from dumping. Question is, can the rest of the market do that? Can the rest of these big names do that? They're also going to be tied in directly with uh, a connection to FOMC, like Apple reports one day later. It's going to need impeccable earnings, stellar, absolutely amazing earnings, or I think it's going to get kicked in the face. We'll see. So we got that trend line breakover in Apple. Uh, you know, kind of depending on where you want to draw it. It's a solid trend line breakover. Really nice expansion 
but you know it's hard to make an argument that Apple's going to be able to get through this 150 152 zone without a significant catalyst and earnings of course can be that significant catalyst but again it's going to tie right in with FOMC and they're going to need nearly perfect earnings. Down this morning, along with everything else. So looking at the, uh, the S&P and the NASDAQ, we're down 1% in the NASDAQ, down more than three quarters of a percent in the ES. The VIX is sitting pretty stable, really. Let's so jump over to the VIX futures. So, you know, it kind of picked up a little bit from this fade, but it's not going ballistic. We are back above that 20 and, um, you know, if we start to rally this morning in the ES and the NASDAQ, I really want to see that VIX get back below the 20 and preferably test that $19 area. We're still looking for the floor here on the VIX. We know it's not going back to zero. We're just looking for the new structure, the new low structure, right, of what that, that new number is going to be. We are wound up relatively tight in U.S. dollar China. So look for that breakout above 675 or a breakdown of 674. It's a really tight consolidated zone. US dollar Japan above 130 and a half. I would call it 130 and a quarter would be something to be concerned about. So kind of keep your eye on that. There are still calls for the dollar to head down to around 100, maybe 99, 98 area. They're still looking for weakness in the dollar short term and that any move up that we've been seeing in the dollar is likely just a reverberation of bounce. Remember that Bank of Japan is going to be coming out with changes at some point in the next few months the current guy is leaving and they've got he's got an opportunity to make one more announcement before he goes the expectation is that he's not going to change anything he's had time to change something during his entire reign and he didn't so you know it's hard to believe that now on his last announcement that he's actually going to try to change some policy uh, the expectation is that the new guy is going to make announcements and change policy. So the, the last part of March would be the time frame to really be concerned of with the U.S. dollar Japan. We got the China ADRs up, which is kind of interesting considering that sell-off that we saw in the Asian markets. But Baidu closed at 139. It's sitting at 142 and a quarter. Well, I guess it's not the ADRs because Baba closed at 118 and is sitting at 112. So it's not the ADRs themselves. It just seems to be Baidu. All of these Tesla, Apple, Baba, Meta, Netflix, NVIDIA, they're all down. But Microsoft is 
down less is what I was going to say, but maybe not so much. Let's go jump in and take a look at these on the intraday. Notice, by the way, before we leave this, the big green candle on Friday is now in control on a lot of these names. So like NVIDIA, Friday's big green candle. Meta on Friday. It's going to be the level that price is going to have to get through. And it, since it's wide like that, on a lot of these names, that might be all that we get coming into FOMC. For Microsoft, you know, it, it's very likely that we focus on Thursday's level instead of Friday's. Because Friday, it really just gave us that evening star reversal. All right, the expectation is for Microsoft to stay within Thursday's range. That'd be 242 on the downside. We could focus on Thursday's close, which I think has more weight to it than Thursday's high. It's, it's not far off, 248. So looking at a $6 range here in Microsoft. The expectation is if we get another breakout on the top side here, just focus on where we hit our head in earnings that 254 area and a breakdown below 242 well we're just looking to revisit the 232 area All right so not a whole lot of opportunity here on in either direction ten dollars maybe just remember don't diddle in the middle and there's our our high and our low right so if you're looking for a shorter term opportunity breaking outside of thursday's zone or thursday's level would be the play for Microsoft. For Apple, it's gonna be Fridays and not Thursdays. If we do manage to break below 143, then we're gonna focus on 139. That would be Wednesday's low. Just remember that we can wick below 143, even a little bit, right? Down to like 142 and then turn around and come right back into the box again. So just because we get outside of this box doesn't mean that the game is on, right? Very likely we'll get a little bit of a busby, let that follow through, and then you'd have your downside play. If we do manage to rally back up and break out on Apple, then we're still looking at 150 as a significant level of resistance in the overhead. So, you know, if we get above 147, 150 is the ceiling until FOMC at least. Same thing with Tesla, it's sitting inside of Friday. It's a long ways down to Friday's low around that 160 area. Even if we do manage to get below that, Thursday's low is very likely where we uh, where we stop while we wait for FOMC at 154. 
So it's a long ways down, but this hasn't rolled over yet. I mean, it's, it's certainly starting to, but we don't have a bear signal yet. Again, a market can set a high, pull back and consolidate right there in that zone and then break out again. It would look a lot like that, right? Building up a position underneath that resistance level for the breakout. Pre-breakout accumulation. All right, same thing with Google. It's sitting inside of Friday. Not much of a surprise. Like I warned about on Friday or a number of times last week, watch the 100 level, not just in Google, but in a lot of these names. 100 is a not just a round number, but one of the most significant round numbers that you'll see in trading. Right now, Friday's candle is in full control. If we break below Friday's candle, we're going to focus on January 20s low. That'd be $95. Google does have a market maker move this morning. The zone is pretty clear now that we're back on the intraday. A lot of these markets now have this peak. It's from Friday. Some of them have you know a pre-market peak, but most of them have this peak on Friday. That sets us up for a head fake dump. All right. So look for a run to the upside this morning. Not necessarily in Google, but in, in all of these names that have that Friday peak. Look for a run into that. And then a dump, right? And we could even we could even overshoot it, but I mean, like with spy, it's already too far away. The ones that I would be more concerned about are the ones that are still holding somewhere in that upper area. Netflix has had two days of this grindy sideways, a whole lot of nothing. And we broke down out of it this morning. So we may finally be seeing that reversal that everybody has been focused on in Netflix. Um, but it's still anticipated to be a short term pullback. All right. This is still on the um, 2023 bullish contrarian list from Seeking Alpha. So, you know, um, this gap that it closed is done, but it's still a significant level that we would expect price to um, hold above. It most certainly needs to hold above 135 and that's a long ways off so we could pull back a long ways and it would still be bullish right it wouldn't even start to be bearish 
till we got below that 315. So a long ways off. Looking at it on the weekly, you can still see that bullish sentiment. So if you're trying to short this thing, do it gently and be ready to change course. Because um, I don't think it's done yet. All right, so PayPal is completely outside of Friday's breakout. And right now we're sitting inside of Thursday's zone. That break below 78 half, and we will focus on 76. If you wanted to tighten that up a little bit, a break below 80 and a quarter, and you could target the low of Thursday, that 78 half zone. Just be careful. A lot of these names now have a significant gap that needs to be filled. And a lot of times, no matter what they're going to do on the week, they fill that gap first, right? So even if we were going to be bearish here, we could, in the short term, run back up to 82 first and then dump. Here, for an example, from the previous week, we ended high on the Friday. Uh, in the pre-market on Monday, it was weak. And it ran back up and closed the gap on Monday. Of course, it really didn't do much on Tuesday or Wednesday, but it did get that gap closed. In the NASDAQ, play it by the levels that we have a break below 291 and a quarter will give us a new target to Thursday's low. Just use the RTH 288 and a half. A break below Thursday's low, and we will start targeting Wednesday. You could start with Wednesday's cash open 284 and then Wednesday's low 281. It does leave a significant gap in between these two. There's Tuesday's low. Kind of clean that hole up a little bit. But other than that, it, it's just a big air pocket, really. So this is a really great example of the names that we've been looking at this morning, the NY Fang. It's got Apple and Microsoft and Tesla and Baidu and Baba. So you can see the strength of all of those names on Friday and then that clear topping pattern and a mild break down. But it was only a mild breakdown. We were still sitting at some you know, significant highs. And the financials also topped out closed in the upper part of the day, managed to maintain and keep that inside day breakout, which is what those yellow lines are from Thursday. So, you know, we closed, even though we pulled back off of that close or off of those highs to go into the close, we still closed relatively bullish. And this weakness this morning 
it needs follow through. Um, but even this with spy pulled back as much as it has, it can still recover from this and turn bullish. I don't see it. I'm not making a bullish argument here. I'm just saying don't short it just because we've started the pullback. And keep your eye on FOMC this week. 394 is the expectation for SPY if we continue to move to the downside. Play it level by level. First, we got to get through 400. If we can get through 400, there's not much of an argument to make that we won't see 394. Got a little bit of uh, resistance or support, depending on which way you want to look at it, 398. So just about every $2 from 402 to 400, from 400 to 398, and then 394. A little bit of a jump there towards the end, which makes sense, right? Because if we were going to get that capitulation move, we'd get you know one last hurrah and the dump down before hedging kicks in and we flip over and run back up again. Also, keep in mind the February FOMC is not the end of the story because we have another one in March. All right. The discussion about Europe being slightly bullish when I started the stream this morning it now is finally presenting with a little bit of red. Asia tried to recover a little bit, but that seems to have died off. And crude again, headed to the downside. So we had that nice gap up, gap close. Then we set this lower high. We're now looking to set a lower low. Silver's up this morning, oddly. All right, so we're looking at US dollar Japan. Uh, we've been maintaining really nice underneath that daily 20 period moving average with each new test being um, the start of a new short. So we're watching this now to see if we're going to finally make it through the 20, a break above that 20 period moving average. And we're going to focus on the 50 and that would be at 133 and a half. So a move in US dollar Japan to the upside would very likely be a move in the S&P to the downside, also in the NASDAQ. And you can see how this momentum oscillator has started to turn over now it's only just started right this thing if we were to um, change the line type to where there were dots to show you know each new day today's dot hasn't formed yet so this blue line could easily drop right back down again just like it did back here right it needs to uh, get above the zero line for a nice full turnaround these are slow moving indicators. They don't, they're not responsive. They're never going to, you know, let you call tops and bottoms with an indicator like this. This is more of sustaining the move, right? Like a, like a big ocean uh, voyage ship can't just turn around on a dime. Those container ships have big wide turns. So when they're pointed in a particular direction, you know, it's not hard to tell which direction they're going. Same thing with these. These things suck at reversals. So let it get above zero and you would have your 
confirmation of US dollar Japan heading back towards that 150 area. There's resistance to deal with on the way down. Look at the selling pattern here. Now, very clean and uniform it is. How it goes at their finest. So, you know, don't get in front of the freight train. Let this prove that it's going to turn around. And remember the implications of it. If this does turn around and begin going to the upside, that would be continued weakness in the S&P and the NASDAQ. And gold. With everything down this morning, it's a little bit of a surprise, but we do have some automotive names that are up. Uh, the EV markets like LCID, Lucid. Kind of a XOS is another one. And then a couple of these battery name ones. Okay, even Riven is up this morning, 1.8. Tesla, um, three quarters of a percent. Yeah, the, the move in crypto was a part of that whole uh, dash for trash, low float, high shorted names that were getting a bump in January as um, funds were exiting out of their huge short positions, buying to cover. That buying fueled this short term run in, in trash, which included a lot of crypto companies and crypto names. So not much of a surprise that that trash is finally falling back down again. I know there was a, a million different articles and stories out there. If you looked for every one of those trash companies, like, oh, you know, look, they're finally turning around. This is the year. Buy it on the lows. You'll never have a better chance for your investment. <laughs> okay, yeah, whatever. You know, it's still trash. And that trash that has been heavily shorted for a while had a nice bullish bump when these firms got out of the uh, the shorts that they've been holding. So not much of a surprise that that trash now is starting to settle back down again. It might not be done, by the way. So, you know, I wouldn't necessarily um, cut it in everything. Crypto was only one of those spaces, right? Um, pot stocks was another one. Oh, I mean, there's there's a lot of categories to kind of pick and choose from. And hard to say that all of them are done. It's very likely a, a hurry up and wait this week. You know, uh, there's a number of people that just don't trade during the FOMC week. This is the time where they go on vacation or, you know, they get some honeydews done around the house and they just don't trade. And when I was newer to trading, I thought, why would you not want to trade? The market's open. Let's get it. Let's do it. But you know, if you're looking for good, solid plays, even just some good day trades that last through the day without a bunch of chopping trash, then you're going to want to avoid this week.
We do have a market maker move now in SPY. A dollar seventy three, add it to today's two sixty five. That's a fairly good size move on today, right? For a, a one day expected move. Keep in mind, after we get our FOMC announcement, volatility is very likely going to fall down. Even if the market falls, we're very likely going to see volatility fall. It's running at about a two-point spread right now between Wednesday and Thursday. All right, everybody. Be careful. Be safe. Have a good week. Keep your eye on the clock. We have additional auctions, and I will see you all tomorrow.